Um, so, oh, it's just a second there. So good morning and welcome to our session on Alberta's economic recovery plan with Minister Schweitzer. My name is Heather Bitts and I'm the executive director of your Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. As Marley mentioned, the session today is being recorded and it will be available um, later for viewing if so desired or for sharing with others who maybe missed the session today. This morning, I am pleased to welcome Minister Doug Schweitzer, who was elected to the Legislative Assembly of Alberta on April 16th, 2019, as the MLA for Calgary Elbow. A dedicated husband, father of two girls, and a long-serving community volunteer, Schweitzer has a strong record of public service, including previously raising funds for military families and serving as vice chair of the Calgary Drug Treatment Court. He is passionate about restoring Alberta's promise, an Alberta in which no matter where you come from, if you've worked hard, you can succeed. Schweitzer previously was a partner at a leading Alberta law firm as a restructuring and bankruptcy lawyer. This experience gave him a firsthand view of the staggering impacts of failed policies that have led to job losses, economic stagnation, and a loss of hope. Dr. Schweitzer was appointed as Alberta's Minister of Jobs, Economy, and Innovation on August 25th, 2020. Schweitzer will oversee the implementation of Alberta's recovery plan, its sector strategies, and Alberta's growth agenda. Schweitzer previously held the position of Alberta's Minister of Justice and Solicitor General, where he made important progress tackling rural crime, advancing aspects of the Fair Deal panel report recommendations, and creating a faster, fairer, and more responsible justice system. I'd also like to welcome Samantha Wood, stakeholder relations with Minister Schweitzer's office uh, today, who is also joining us. Um, so welcome to you both. Um, and as noted earlier, we do have our MLA, Nate Horner, uh, joining us today. So I would like to welcome you all. And before I turn the session over to Mr. Schweitzer, please note there will be a Q&A period at the end. So if you could type your questions into the chat box, we will ensure they are addressed following the presentation. And Marley will handle those questions at the end uh, and read them back to us. So now at this time, I'd like to turn the, uh, the meeting over to the minister. Welcome. Perfect, and, and thank you so much, everybody, for taking time out of your morning to join this Zoom chat. Uh, hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to do these in person again. Uh, but the one thing I will note is that I can get across Alberta from my basement a lot more efficiently than it takes to drive, because I'm giving a speech in a couple hours to the Peace River Chamber of Commerce, and there's no way I could do that unless I had a jet, uh, and I don't have a jet. So <laughs> uh, the one plus of the pandemic is that people are adopting these technologies, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat. Uh, on the Q&A session, that, that, that's the best part of these. We're trying to reach out to as many chambers of commerce uh, across Alberta. I think our plan by the end of this month is to talk to about 60 chambers in the province. Uh, getting feedback as well, uh, we're going to obviously share some information on trends that we're seeing and policies that we're bringing in, uh, but would really love to get your feedback on what you'd like to see for your community, what we could do to help uh, make life better uh, and create uh, more opportunities for people to invest, grow, create jobs, uh, have vibrant communities. So happy to take that feedback, uh, as well as my colleague Nate Horner is on the line. Uh, and he and I will tag team uh, the Q&A session together. It, it always works out best uh, when you kind of have that local uh, perspective from your elected officials as well. So Nate, thanks for joining and, uh, and being a part of this here today. As far as my uh, kind of speech goes, I'll try to even talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, give you an update on the pandemic. Uh, obviously that's kind of thought, top of mind for so many people right now. Uh, talk a little bit about what we're seeing big picture wise uh, in Alberta, as well as nationally and also trends that we're seeing in North America. Uh, and then we'll get into different industries uh, and our sector strategies, industry strategies that we have uh, and we're working on for the province of Alberta. So that'll be kind of the three pieces of, of the presentation. Uh, starting first uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we know it's been a hard time. Uh, I know that there's been lots of frustration in the last you know, year plus that we've been in this pandemic, uh, just dealing with you know, health restrictions, everything else that's going on in life. And just a huge thank you to all the small businesses for their patience and their help, uh, keeping our communities healthy across Alberta. And you know, right now, when you take a look at this, we're, there's really is light at the end of the tunnel. And the reason why I say that is that if you take a look at the stats and the data coming out of countries that have been ahead of Canada on vaccination, so Israel, the United Kingdom, the United States, 
uh, we've, we are truly on the cusp of getting to that point where the vaccines that are in Canada are really going to make a material difference uh, in the spread of COVID across our communities. So the reason why I say that, if you uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways they track stats on vaccinations. There's there's lots of different ways. Every it seems like every country and every, even almost every province reports a little bit differently on how they're tracking their stats on this. Um, but if you just go to a simple, if you're ever curious, just Google three words, COVID case tracker. Uh, and Google has this amazing uh, kind of algorithm that they do where you can check check any country, you can look up every state uh, on vaccinations, cases, everything else that goes along with it. And right now, Canada has just passed uh, with at least one dose, about 40% of our population uh, has received about one dose. Uh, if you tracked in the United States, uh, they've actually kind of plateaued around 46, 47% of their population uh, has received at least one dose. They're, they're way ahead of us on second doses, so they have more protection for their individuals that have been vaccinated. Uh, but again, they're around 46, 47%. And they got there a few weeks ago, they kind of started to get into the 40% range. Maybe even almost a month ago, they started to get into that category. Uh, the United Kingdom, they're sitting in that 52, 53, 54% range of having at least one dose. They're now trying to catch up on their second doses. Uh, Israel's close to 60% overall. And what you're seeing, in, particularly in the country like Israel, is that they, they went through the exact same thing that we we're going through, where the variants came into their country right as the vaccines were starting to arrive. Uh, and they had a massive spike in cases. But once they kind of got to that critical mass, kind of that 40% plus, they started to see that massive down the turn in cases spreading across their communities. And now you're starting to see situations in Israel, a country of about eight, nine million people, where they had no deaths in certain days. Uh, really, you know, drop dramatically in cases, hospitalization. So we're taking a look at that uh, and we're starting to see positive impacts across Canada in this third wave, even though cases are higher, deaths have really dropped off. Uh, you know, the, the catastrophic impacts have really dropped overall. So we're hopeful in this um, and we're kind of getting to that point where we've got enough vaccines out. It takes two to three weeks for it to, have, to give people that initial protection from the vaccine. So we're hopeful that, you know, later this month as we get into early June, we're really going to see uh, an impact of the vaccines across our communities. One last thing to note on the pandemic, uh, if you're a small business that's been impacted by the health orders, uh, apply for the most recent tranche of the relaunch grant. Uh, we put in place another uh, you know, portal application process for up to $10,000. Uh, just Google Biz Connect. So Biz, B-I-Z, uh, Connect, Alberta. And that will take you to a portal, uh, same eligibility criteria as the earlier rounds of the business support, uh, so the relaunch grant that we had in place, uh, drop of 30% of revenue impacted by health orders. The typical turnaround time is about uh, 10 days overall uh, for most applications. So again, encourage people to participate in that program. It's open until the end of May. So we have a few more weeks left here to apply for that, uh, that support for small businesses in, in Alberta. Turning now from the pandemic, uh, I just wanted to give that to everybody so everybody's up to date on what's happening. Uh, turning now from the pandemic to what we're seeing overall. Uh, and if you take a look at uh, the reports coming out from the Conference Board of Canada, BMO, National Bank, Desjardins, lots of financial institutions are forecasting that Alberta is going to lead the country in GDP growth as well as job growth in 2021. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for this, uh, but obviously some of the biggest stories that are coming out uh, is the rebound of our oil and gas uh, market uh, internationally. You know, WTI prices are hovering in the mid $60 range, natural gas prices have been stronger, uh, and we're really starting to see, you know, companies that were in financial difficulty in 2020, uh, just recent reports uh, going out there showing that they're generating billions of dollars of profit uh, in the first quarter uh, of this year. So really we're starting to see that rebound. Now these companies have to kind of get their own house, their fiscal houses in order for many of these companies, uh, right size their balance sheet, deal with their lenders. But we're really anticipating that by the second half of this year, uh, as long as prices continue on the trajectory and many people are forecasting, you know, Goldman Sachs, others are forecasting kind of 75, potentially even $80 plus oil. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity here for these companies to generate a significant amount of revenue. And as you get into that second half of the year, you know, what are they going to have to look at? They can either do uh, dividends, they can do share buybacks, or they can spend their capital uh, on reinvesting, uh, reinvesting in further capital expenditures for the production, uh, other types of investments that are going to create jobs uh, and, you know, infrastructure here in our province. So lots of reasons to be optimistic about a rebound. It's still, you know, people are still a little bit tentative right now, but lots of reasons to be optimistic for the second half of this year as we get into 2022 as well in the oil and gas industry. 
Uh, I don't need to tell folks on this phone call or on this Zoom call uh, about the you know the agricultural sector. 2020 was a it was an excellent year. Uh, prices remain high. We're uh, we're bullish on what 2021 is going to look like in the ag sector. I uh, can't predict the weather, but uh, again, prices at least look promising. Forestry, lumber industry, uh, all-time highs for lumber, big demand in that space. Uh, so again, our forestry industry across Alberta is doing exceptionally well. So when you take a look at the conventional economy of Alberta, so the main the commodity-driven market that we have in many areas, uh, it's all looking promising. We actually haven't seen this type of a trajectory. I think the last time would have been seven plus years ago, maybe 2014, where we had that many indicators with stable, you know, kind of stable looking outlooks, uh, things trending in the right direction. So it's encouraging to see that uh, kind of macro big picture outlook for Alberta be positive. Uh, on top of that, we're also starting to see an immense amount of diversification come into Alberta's economy here in the last little while. And, uh, and I'll talk about that when we get into our industry and sector strategies, because uh, we're seeing huge growth in lots of areas uh, that I think are going to have big opportunities, particularly the folks in the Drumheller and surrounding region. There's lots of really interesting things happening that I think uh, the communities there could capitalize on. Uh, kind of turning now, so we have like, these main, you know, these headwinds that are there that are going to be helpful for Alberta's economy. But we also, as a government, we take a look at what's the big picture framework? What's the macro outlook look like that we can create the right framework in Alberta to just help every industry, help every business, help every community in our province by having that best possible environment to attract investment and create jobs in Alberta? So we, it's kind of, it's a three-pronged approach. The first approach is around taxes. So we accelerated the job creation tax cut, lowering corporate taxes down to 8%. Alberta now has the lowest corporate taxes in all of Canada by a considerable amount. Uh, and if President Biden in the United States goes forward with his current tax strategy, he's going to you know, jack up uh, corporate taxes in the United States. Alberta is going to have arguably the lowest taxes in North America. There might be one or two states in the U.S., maybe Texas that could keep up with Alberta. But we are really going to put our flag in the ground saying we want investment. We want you to grow. Uh, if you're a business that's looking at setting up a, you know, an, an office or a headquarters, we want you in Alberta. So that's a really big opportunity for us, making sure we differentiate ourselves and creating that competitive framework. Uh, the next piece is around efficient government. So when it comes to efficient government, uh, Alberta for the longest time, we were a nail in the board and stood out for how much more we were spending per person than any other jurisdiction in Canada. So in this first term, uh, we've been disciplined. Our finance minister has been you know, driving this uh, for us. Uh, and we're, we're going to be bringing our spending down to the big province average in Canada. So from being a complete outlier to being down to the big province average in Canada for spending, that is a massive undertaking. Uh, and it's a big part of our strategy around efficient government. And that's going to allow us to keep our taxes down. Uh, and again, that's a big part of our strategy, efficient government, tax competitive. And building into our efficient government approach, as we look at every single ministry, uh, it's forced us to kind of go look at how do we innovate? How do we bring in new technologies into different ministries? And one example I like to give uh, is when I was justice minister, uh, we were still using the fax machine as the most efficient way to file documents remotely uh, in Alberta. And my kids wouldn't even know what a fax machine is. And that was the most efficient way. And you, you go into these courthouses and the clerks are amazing. They do amazing work. But it was straight out of the 1970s and 1980s where people would be taking paper, you know, they'd be, their, their organizational skills are exceptional, but it was paper management. Uh, we actually had weight restrictions on certain floors because they had so much paper on them. Like it was uh, an area that required, just to say, a little bit of innovation and, ad and an adoption of technology. And so we've now eliminated the fax machine. We're using emails, we're using, we were developing web portals. There's lots of different ways that we could become far more efficient save taxpayers money, provide a better service. So we're looking at similar ways of doing that, providing a better service or equivalent service for less money by making sure that we leverage innovation and technology across all departments of government. So on that theme as well, we wanna make sure that we're there for businesses and make sure that our government works for them. And so we're actually actively working towards hitting our goal and target of reducing red tape on businesses by one third. Uh, we're halfway through our mandate right now, and we're halfway to that goal. So Minister Hunter uh, from Southern Alberta, he's our Minister of Red Tape Production. Uh, and you know what? Yeah, he's just diligent on this every single day, working at trying to find ways to reduce red tape uh, across all the ministries of government. Uh, he's eliminated over 100,000 uh, redundant regulations in Alberta. Uh, that's a huge undertaking. 
uh, and we're not done yet. So we got to continue to be there. If you have ideas, suggestions, feedback that on something specific, uh, you could take three forms down to one form, uh, save employees time because that's really key for us. And just in the first year, I can't wait to see what a second year report says, but in the first year alone, uh, it's estimated that we saved businesses close to a half billion dollars. And that's employee time, filing fees, legal costs, all of the things that go into uh, it's just kind of dealing with uh, the government of Alberta and the bureaucracy and the red tape that we built up. Uh, so again, big part of our strategy, uh, you know, tax reduction, efficient government. The third pillar is around talent. So we're working with our advanced education minister, our minister of labor, uh, on making sure our post-secondary institutions are generating the talent for today and tomorrow. Uh, our advanced education minister just launched his 2030 strategy, lots of new skills for the trades, skills and apprenticeships, uh, lots of focus there on practical skill sets for Albertans. Uh, as well with our minister of labor, uh, he's working on a jobs now uh, strategy to entice businesses to hire unemployed Albertans, training them. We know it, it costs a lot of money to train a new employee. Um, we're gonna help alleviate some of that cost. So that's in our budget. Uh, look for the details on that here soon around our jobs now uh, strategy. So that's another big piece. So taxes, efficient government, talent. That's kind of the big pieces that uh, we need to focus on uh, as a government to lay the foundation for success uh, across Alberta. You know, turning now into kind of the industries and the sector strategies. And, and this is where we can kind of get into some more of the, the detail work that we're doing uh, in lots of different areas. And you know, one, a couple of ones that I'll highlight that I think would probably be of a real interest in the community is around agriculture in particular. I mean, obviously 2020, like I was mentioning, was an excellent year, uh, but we wanna make sure that we continue to build on the foundation that we have in Alberta. We know that there's gonna continue to be a demand for our agricultural products uh, and the yields that we generate in our province. So earlier in 2020, uh, we announced a partnership with irrigation districts, as well as the Canada Infrastructure Bank uh, for an $800 million investment in irrigating 200,000 acres uh, in Southern Alberta. Uh, again, that's gonna create over $400 million of GDP every year, thousands of jobs, uh, big ripple effect, opportunities for processing facilities, other things that go into the ag space. So again, another critical area for us uh, open to other ideas, suggestions though, is there, you know, is there, is there infrastructure we need that helps to, you know, capitalize on this opportunity? What else could be required? Uh, we're looking for further partnerships as well with irrigation districts across the province uh, to capitalize on this. And it also helps us make sure that we preserve our water. I mean, obviously water is always a big challenging issue in our province uh, and managing it uh, efficiently is really key. Uh, so again, these irrigation strategies are going to help us uh, make sure that we leverage our water opportunities in Alberta as well. Uh, and I know if, if there's any ag questions, though, I might probably defer those to Nate, because I think Nate knows this a lot better than a downtown Calgary lawyer. Uh, so I'll make sure uh, if you get into any ag questions, uh, I'll, I'll partner up with Nate to be able to answer those. Uh, turning out into a really interesting area where we're seeing big opportunities for growth, diversification, uh, and it has a partnership between jobs, but also from a tourism perspective as well, and attracting people here to experience Alberta. Uh, and that's film and television. Uh, I know recently the, the Ghostbusters film, uh, was, was a lot of it was done in the Drumheller region. Uh, and we want to make sure that we enhance and grow the film and television industry in Alberta. And so when I took on this file in, in August of last year, uh, we took a look at, okay, how do we build this out in our province? Vancouver, British Columbia is known internationally as one of the best hubs for film and television. You got Toronto, Ontario, again, another big hub for you know, film and television. And Alberta, well, even though we've had, you know, Oscar winning films filmed here, uh, we were lagging behind in film and television. So we met with, you know, Warner Brothers, HBO, Netflix, Disney, uh, got feedback for how do we attract your investment into Alberta? And it was all tax driven. It was all tax structure driven. So we fixed our tax credit uh, in Alberta. And just like that, uh, we're starting to attract a significant number of productions, uh, even more than we've ever had uh, into Alberta. We're on track for a record year. There's rumblings that the, we're hopeful that we can get this to the goal line, but there's rumblings that the largest ever television series shot in Canada coming to Alberta. Uh, you know, again, we're starting to see film studios being built uh, in our province, private sector driven film studios that we never had before uh, here being built because uh, they see a long-term stable industry uh, foundation that we want to set up uh, in our province. And this is key. Uh, and a lot of it is being centered uh, in Southern Alberta. So a lot of it is around, they will use kind of Calgary as a hub. Uh, but the reason why they like Calgary as a hub is that you can get to communities like Drumheller in a very short period of time. You can get to the mountains in a very short period of time from Calgary. There's also the, they love the 
kind of the rural small town settings that they can get uh, and the buy-ins of the community for the necessary jobs that come along with it. There's carpenter jobs, painting, electricians. They work with small businesses buying, you know, you got catering needs. They've got lumber yards that they need to go to. So it's a big small business driver for us as well. And we're really encouraged to see the momentum that that space has. Now, the other really interesting piece of film and television is that it has a big impact on tourism. A uh, huge impact of tourism. So, for example, we, we took a look at the United Kingdom and how they leverage Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, uh, House of Cards. It's not House of Cards. You got, you got Game of Thrones. You got, uh, you got a whole bunch of different films that have been filmed in the UK that are really just tourism drivers uh, for that province, for that country. They attract you know, thousands and thousands of people every single year. It creates a huge number of jobs in the province because they leverage you know, the people's favorite shows to attract people to come in. And, and we want to do the exact same thing uh, in Alberta. Perfect example with the most recent Ghostbusters film. You can tell if you're in Alberta and you can tell right away that those visuals are drum hell. Like the visuals are unique. Uh, it's the beautiful scenery that they've set. Uh, and people are going to want to go see that. If that's their favorite movie, you've got kids and they love that movie, they're going to want to take their families there. So we want to make sure that we partner with Travel Alberta. So Travel Alberta is our crown corporation. Uh, that markets Alberta, but we've also shifted its focus to a destination management organization uh, that wants to partner with local communities to make the tourism experience even better. We've increased their budget by 50% uh, as well because we know how important tourism is to the long-term impacts in so many communities. Uh, I know personally as a, you know, I, my, I love taking my family uh, to Drumheller, you've got the, you know, the you know, Royal Tayevrel, you know, you have the dinosaurs, everything that's there. So we wanna make sure we enhance that, build on it. Uh, so again, if there's a community organization, small businesses on the line here uh, that are in the tourism industry, reach out to Travel Alberta. Uh, they've got new programs that they're launching, destination management initiatives to help make the experience even better. Uh, so take a look at that and reach out to them if you haven't already. Big opportunities for us in this. We think there's a big opportunity to leverage film and television in partnership and collaboration with tourism. Uh, and once we can get travel opened up, we need to get people back flying into Alberta. Uh, so much of our tourism industry is based off of flying into our province. So we got to get that going here uh, once it's safe to do so. Uh, turning now uh, into a couple other topics before we open up into the Q&A. Uh, I mean, obviously, I've already commented quite a bit on their, you know, some of our big economic drivers like the oil and gas industry. But the one thing that I'm finding really interesting, and this is being led by our Minister of Energy, uh, Sonia Savage, is that we had it so good in Alberta for many decades that we never even really bothered to look for what other mineral or resource opportunities there were in our province. Uh, so right now, our Minister of Energy is doing a whole mines and minerals of strategy, building it out, doing a scan of Alberta. And internationally, there's huge demand right now for a whole bunch of new minerals. So electric vehicles, batteries, you've got all the critical minerals that go into our smartphones. Uh, the United States as well with its military requires these minerals as well for advanced weaponry. And with the tension between the United States and China, China controls about 80% of the marketplace for these critical minerals uh, and rare earth minerals. So there's an opportunity for Alberta to play a leadership role in Canada and in North America for this to build out a stable and secure supply chain. Uh, and we're seeing an immense amount of success from companies based here. There's a company called E3 Metals uh, which is right now taking lithium, which is a big component uh, that goes into lots of these goods, uh, lithium right out of active oil and gas wells. We have companies working on bitumen beyond combustion, uh, leveraging further things that being extracted from the, the oil sands. Uh, again, carbon fiber, there's lots of different ways that we can leverage uh, our natural resources here in Alberta and build on our expertise. We have the intellectual horsepower as a province, we have the workforce, uh, and it just builds. Uh, and a lot of these things would have been kind of seen as byproducts before, and now they have an immense amount of value and extracting them uh, responsibly is just another big part of our diversification strategy and creates job opportunities as well, leveraging the skill sets uh, that Albertans have right now. Building on that theme of kind of leveraging the technology that we've developed in the oil and gas industry, geothermal is actually another big a big opportunity for us. Uh, we've seen companies like Ever recently that's based in here in Southern Alberta, they've raised a significant amount of money from some of the largest energy companies in the world, uh, leveraging basically horizontal drilling technology to advance geothermal and using the earth as a battery for heat uh, that creates power, their plans to the heat or provide power to over a million homes in this decade. Again, big opportunities in geothermal, leveraging our expertise uh, in oil and gas and drilling and everything else that we do well. 
Uh, so again, another opportunity to diversify our economy. We brought in place a brand new geothermal regime to allow this and to facilitate it. Uh, building as well on our abundance of natural gas that we have in our province, we've deployed a natural gas strategy. Minister Nally is our natural gas minister. And it's kind of four key prongs that go into it. Uh, the one is LNG. We still want to get our natural gas to international markets. Uh, that's key. So LNG, there's a whole piece there on LNG. Uh, next piece is around recycling. So a lot of us put our, our recyclable goods in the blue bins. We do our part. Uh, but we have to make sure that we can do the full life cycle of plastics. And there's a big opportunity for Alberta to play a leadership role in, in North America when it comes to recycling. Uh, so we're developing out uh, our expertise in this area. It builds on our petrochemical expertise, the, you know, the advanced uh, machinery that we have in Alberta that can help us develop out this industry. So again, really another area that complements the petrochemical sector, other industries that we've built out in our province. Next is actually petrochemicals. Uh, so we put in place a brand new incentive to attract petrochemical investment into Alberta. This levels the playing field with jurisdictions like New Orleans and others uh, that have very competitive tax regimes in place. So we, we built that out in Alberta and we're getting an immense amount of interest right now. We're hoping that we'll be able to attract billions of dollars of investment <clears throat> into our petrochemical industry uh, in Alberta. And that's gonna create thousands of construction jobs uh, long-term jobs as well in Alberta, uh, enhancing the value of our products uh, and our just the, the jobs that come along with it. Big opportunity for us in petrochemicals. Uh, the last one is, in that strategy that's kind of key to note is around hydrogen. Uh, and just uh, yesterday, uh, ATCO and Suncor announced their planned development of a significant hydrogen facility here in Alberta. Again, this is big money, uh, likely going to be billions of dollars going into that type of a facility here in Alberta. Uh, hydrogen leverages uh, our natural gas. We can do this in a clean way, leveraging carbon capture, lots of the ways that we can develop this out. Uh, the federal government has put uh, you know, certain parameters around a strategy around carbon capture. There's opportunities for us in Alberta uh, to leverage the amount of money that's out there in the world that wants to go into hydrogen. One thing just to note on this is that there are, is literally you know, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars around the world looking to be deployed right now in hydrogen. And Alberta, if you take a look internationally, we literally have one of the best opportunities to develop clean hydrogen right now in our province. We have some of the best formations, infrastructure, workforce uh, to be able to get this done. So that's why we're seeing an immense amount of interest. Uh, that's why I believe ATCO and Suncor made that announcement this week. We have other companies as well that are taking a look at hydrogen and, and deploying billions of dollars into this space uh, right now in Alberta. We're seeing the rail companies are exploring hydrogen opportunities. The long-term trucking companies, a long haul, sorry, long haul trucking companies are exploring hydrogen. So lots of opportunities for Alberta to continue to be an innovator in energy. Uh, and again, create further job opportunities for Albertans. I've got uh, two more quick topics uh, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Uh, one as well is around technology. Uh, and we know that uh, rural broadband connectivity is key. This uh, During this pandemic, we've seen the ability of people to work remotely. Uh, we've seen the fact that they used to always say in, if you wanted to be in finance, you had to be in downtown Toronto on Bay Street. Well, Bay Street's been closed for over a year. Basically, it's nobody's in the offices. Everybody's at home. So people, it's really shifted the mindset of many companies, corporations. You got lots of some companies, some of the biggest ones in Canada are saying, we want you to work where you want to work. Lots more flexibility in the workplace. The future of the office is really shifting. So I do believe for a very livable community uh, like Drumhell or beautiful setting, place that would be family friendly, uh, you're starting to see a, a potential trend uh, and you're starting to see indications of people doing this is that they wanna live there. Uh, they can still do their jobs. They can still work remotely, but connectivity is key. Uh, so right now we're building out and, and Nate Horner uh, has got, probably got some good thoughts on this as well. We're working with Minister Glubish or Minister of Service Alberta uh, on a rural broadband strategy. We're hoping to be able to get this to the goal line here in the next little while that'll help you know, create opportunities for Alberta communities that right now don't have the speed of connection. There's a role for us at the provincial level, federal level as well, uh, partnering with the private sector to get this done. So big opportunity there. And the reason why I want to highlight it, because that connectivity levels the playing field, creates opportunities, creates the opportunity for vibrant communities long term, uh, where I do believe many uh, Albertans and Canadians want to live. Uh, the reason why I mentioned it as well is that uh, technology companies in Alberta are growing rapidly. So in 2018, we had just over 1,200 technology companies in our province. Uh, fast forward two years to 2020, uh, we have over 3,000 tech companies uh, in Alberta. 
And not only do we have more companies, but they're also bigger. Uh, so when you take a look at the pie, the percentage of those companies that are larger, raising millions of dollars has grown exponentially. So this is a big success story for Alberta from a diversification standpoint, uh, as well as it, it's tracks consistently with the investments that we're seeing. Uh, to put this in context, 2018, there was $100 million that went into venture capital. 2019, it was 220 million. And then 2020, it was $455 million. So four times in a very short period of time, over four times the investment uh, going into this fast growing industry. They're hiring thousands of Albertans, job opportunities. And again, if we can level the playing field for connectivity, uh, it, people can live where they want to live uh, and do these high paying jobs uh, across the province. So that's really important for our, our strategy long term as well. To build out this industry, uh, we put $175 million into our Alberta Enterprise Corporation, which facilitates venture capital investment in Alberta. We also are uh, put in place a research and development uh, grant called the Innovation Employment Grant, which covers up to 20% of research and development for those you know, kind of early stage companies in Alberta. So big job creation opportunities here, but also with the rural broadband piece, we think it'll help level the playing to field long-term for people to live where they want to live uh, and still have high paying jobs uh, you know, that are could be anywhere in the world uh, where the, head, the company's actually headquartered. Uh, last topic is health. So uh, with this pandemic, uh, early on, it was around personal protective equipment, PPE, masks, things like that, ventilators. Uh, and we saw, you know, masks being held up on tarmacs internationally. They weren't being shipped around the world. People were worried and anxious about these critical health products. Uh, so AHS uh, has pivoted. They have now are producing some of their masks here in Alberta. Uh, they want to make sure they have that stable supply chain. They pivoted and had ventilators built. They had a company that was a basically a technology driven company that was provided services to the oil and gas industry, uh, 3D printing, other things that went along with it. They designed and built ventilators uh, that were there to service AHS, uh, as well as now we're looking at vaccines. Now vaccine nationalism uh, has been an issue uh, as we've seen other countries are ahead of Canada uh, when it comes to vaccinating their population. Uh, there's an opportunity for our province to uh, leverage uh, our buying power of AHS. We spend about kind of mid $20 billion a year in health uh, so again, lots of opportunity there to buy, leverage that buying power to make sure that we can provide for the health security of Albertans. We are unique in the country. Uh, Ontario, for example, has 30 health districts, 30 plus health districts. We're the only province in Canada with one health authority. That gives us the ability to leverage buying power. And that's, that's key. Uh, so right now we've asked for proposals for vaccine development, also looking at how do we leverage and grow our pharmaceutical industry in Alberta. That's a job creation push, but as well as a health security push. Uh, we've received numerous proposals uh, through this initiative and there's some really encouraging uh, building blocks in Alberta. One example of that is at the University of Alberta, we have a Nobel Prize winner in virology. So literally one of the smartest people in the world uh, in developing out vaccines is, it has a presence right here in Alberta. So we wanna build out that research capacity, look at how we can further develop these products and manufacture them right here in, our, in Alberta. So we're doing our homework on that right now and we're looking to partner with the federal government to get that built out in, in our province. So uh, I can get lots of the topics to get into. Uh, there's Invest Alberta, you name it. We're happy to answer the questions. Uh, looking, to tag, look, looking forward to tag teaming the Q&A here uh, with Nate Horner, so I'll stop. So thanks so much so far. Well, thank thanks. you very much. Oh, sorry, Marley. <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to say thank you. That's all great information. And I'll pass it over to Marley to monitor the chat box. I think there is uh, questions or comments in there. And I would encourage anybody else to put their comments in going forward. Yes, yeah, so we've got one question here. Um, coming from Dr. Ram, who's here uh, now. He, I'm sure you've heard this before. If or when we end up with a fourth wave or in a chronic state of COVID where we will need ongoing boosters, et cetera, what will be the plan to further protect small businesses and specifically those in rural areas? Small businesses can't afford to continue starting and stopping their business and the trickle down effect from large industries and businesses, including the energy sector is not going to help small businesses in rural Alberta. Small businesses also can't afford to keep getting loans, whether supported by the government or not, as their debt load is already very high. So, I mean, excellent question uh, on this front here. Obviously, we've asked a lot uh, of small businesses across the province uh, and across the world. Uh, people have asked a lot of small businesses with 
these various health measures that have been brought in place, uh, it's impacted, disrupted so many people's lives. It's, it, we understand that. Uh, one thing that I do believe though, if, if we're in taking a look at the data coming out of countries that are ahead of us in vaccinations, so Israel, the United Kingdom, even in the United States, when you take a look at uh, where they are now in the trajectory of the spread of the, vac of the virus, it all has all dropped off dramatically. Uh, do we have to be ready now uh, for you know, variants in the future, booster shots? Uh, yes. Uh, right now, once we get through this wave here of vaccinations, I mean, we're almost through, I'd say we're, we're very close to getting through this first round of vaccinations. Our goal is to give, uh, or at least have available to all Albertans by the end of June, that first shot. Uh, and then through the summer and into the early fall, that second shot available to all Canadians and all Albertans. Uh, I think at that point in time, uh, it's, it's probably a bit premature right now, but I think at that point in time, uh, further policy discussions are going to be required. Uh, there's going to be other areas of the world. A uh, per perfect example right now is India. Uh, it's going to take a lot longer to vaccinate uh, a population of a billion plus uh, people that are there. <clears throat> we have to look at manufacturing capacity around the world. So this is where that strategy I was mentioning earlier on around building out a domestic uh, vaccine development and manufacturing capacity is going to be key. Uh, because nobody has a crystal ball exactly as to how this is going to unfold. There's likely going to be a need for booster shots at some point in time, just like an annual flu shot. Uh, but we need to build out and build on the research and development that's been done uh, over the last year. The fact that vaccines were developed in one year, most people thought it would take three to five. The fact that they got done in one year and now we actually have these you know, kind of groundbreaking technologies and mRNA vaccines, there's other ones that are developing DNA-based vaccine, lots of innovation, like arguably five to 10 years worth of innovation and research and development happened in one year. Uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, again, we don't have a crystal ball, but I do think once all Canadians have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated, uh, at that point, uh, a policy discussion has to happen about what does the future look like? Uh, hopefully we can get to herd immunity in Canada and hopefully the variants uh, you know, don't, can't penetrate the vaccine protection that's there. Uh, but you know, if, you know, if, if, if this is going to be a long-term policy impact, uh, how do we mitigate it? There's lots of groundbreaking work being done on therapeutics as well. Uh, they're you know, really just starting to take off uh, and you know, recognizing this could be with uh, humanity for a while. So again, uh, we have to monitor it. We know we can't keep disrupting people's lives long-term. Uh, that's a bit long-winded answer, but uh, I do think that there's lots of work that has to be done to this. Uh, getting through that first vaccination wave is key. Uh, then at that point in time, it's you know, how do we create a sustainable model? Because we can't continue to shut down uh, society the way that we have had to over the last year plus. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this is better for you or uh, Minister of Tourism, but that high speed uh, rail from Calgary to Banff, is that still in the works? And are there any other similar tourism projects like that uh, in, the, in the plans? Well, we haven't received any uh, any formal pitch yet on the uh, Calgary to Banff uh, rail line. I know it's it's being it's in the works. I've, I've kind of received a preliminary kind of you know, outline as to what that project could look like. Um, again, it's encouraging. Uh, I want to see what the details look like, cost structure, things along those lines, how it would be funded long term. Uh, but again, it's a really interesting potential project, uh, and that's where we also have Travel Alberta destination management. Uh, so, you know, things like that could be really interesting long term, uh, but as well, if people have ideas for how we can make the experience in Drumheller and the surrounding community even better, I, I do think it is one of the gems uh, of Alberta, uh, just from the beauty of the, of the region, uh, everything else that it has to offer. I always enjoy coming out there. So if you have ideas, suggestions uh, for what we can do to really help take it to that next level, uh, really open to those suggestions. Marley, could I chime in? I, I know yes, the minister would like me to help him answer questions, but I like yeah, yeah, do it too. So, um, I, I know we have some representatives from Starland County on, and uh, although this wouldn't be as as applicable maybe to to the town of Drumheller, um, one of the main uh, issues for a lot of our rural municipalities, um, and I think RMA even kind of has it number one and number two. One you touched on was rural broadband. Uh, needing to really e expand that to um, a lot of different communities with a lot more quality, a lot, lot more, a lot more speed to to be able to run a business in rural Alberta. But the other thing I just was curious if you could touch on, certainly not your ministry, but I, I know it's of, of great concern, is as as these uh, smaller uh, oil and gas companies are are in a little better state here, um, gas is a little stronger. 
Um, you know, the predictions on oil are um, all over the place, but, but looks more than stable. Uh, what, what do you think will be the plan going forward, uh, maybe at the AER, to help with the unpaid property taxes uh, being faced by a lot of these municipalities? I know uh, Reeve Wanstrom's on the line, and, uh, and I believe Jackie Watts uh, from Starline, and I know this is a, a major issue they'd like to, they're, they're working on, but they, they would like to see, see something done. So I just wonder if you could comment for everyone. Uh, I mean, on this one here, there's lots of different government policies that could be brought in place in this area. I know that our Minister of Energy and Minister of Environment are, are actively engaging on this. Uh, I know as well, Municipal Affairs is involved. Like, you got lots of you got a lot of government players that are involved in this, you know, in on this file and in the, with this issue. The one thing that I'll kind of go back to my my legal days. Uh, dangerous when I haven't practiced law in a couple of years, but uh, in, in my insolvency and restructuring world, uh, is that. You know, there's usually what they call a waterfall of priorities uh, that kind of come through uh, when a company's in financial difficulty. Uh, but as their financial picture improves and the, the risk to the senior lenders diminishes, so that as they get more solvent and they can deal with their senior secured lenders, uh, there's more of an opportunity, I would say, as a creditor uh, of a company to put pressure on. Uh, so I, I would encourage uh, municipalities as well Probably to get some uh, fairly sophisticated legal advice would be my one. Would be we have lots of government things. Don't worry, this isn't me put, passing the buck. We're gonna have to take a look at, at this as politicians. Make sure we take, put in place the right framework. Help as much as we can on our end. That's not don't want to pass the buck. But just from a just from a pure legal standpoint, I do think as these companies' solvency uh, improves and their financial position improves, I do think at that point in time there's an opportunity for municipalities to put some pressure on. Uh, to get this issue resolved as well. Uh, it's easier when they're not as much financial distress uh, on the marketplace with better pricing will help. Uh, so I do think that you know, I would get your heads wrapped around how you can put some pressure on those companies uh, just from through the conventional mechanisms. Uh, and then Nate and I can also work with our colleagues in energy and environment on uh, how we can put in place the, you know, some further tools there to, to you know, deal with this issue long-term where if we ever get into another downturn, uh, which it's cyclical, so you, I'm sure we will experience one at some point. Uh, here in the next little while. Uh, so how do we you know, manage this so this, this issue doesn't compound to the state where it is right now? Minister Schweitzer, this is uh, Steve Wants from Starland County. Um, we need you guys to put the effort and to not be scared of oil and gas anymore and make these tough decisions and follow the regulations you have and put new ones in place to control this. We're the only ones that don't have to pay taxes and that's up to you guys and the AER to straighten that out. I don't know what you've done with the AER. I know it was disbanded because of corruption. I don't know what you've done to correct it or who you've got on this board now, but you need to look after that. There's no excuse for it. If there's companies that are failing and you're still letting them take over properties, there's no reason for that. There's also no reason for, for taking this step and doing it. You guys need to push the rest of your MLAs to get their act together. No, and, and I hear you loud and clear on this one. Uh, as far as the AER goes, it is under, we did have to replace the board uh, and bring in some new leadership at the AER uh, to get the management there uh, heading in the right direction. Uh, Nate and I will, I will take this feedback uh, and work with my colleagues. Again, not my exact area, uh, but Nate and I can take this feedback uh, and work with our colleagues to see if we can come up with a further resolution. Uh, I do think though that the the new price environment is going to allow for hopefully a, a, a resolution to help solve this issue in the near term and then position ourselves so we don't ever put ourselves in this spot again. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question here from Jackie with Starland County. Um, with new technology being created in SMR, small nuclear reactor, does the government have a strategy to educate Albertans on nuclear technology and the benefits, not just the downside? and reach out to municipalities that would be great location because of the lack of infrastructure to attract industry using SMRs. I believe that Starland County would be a great location and could bring new jobs in. So on, on this front here, uh, we've partnered with other provinces across Canada on in, in exploring uh, small, small modular uh, reactors. Uh, and for those that uh, are, aren't familiar with this technology, it, it is just fascinating how they use like melted salt and a whole bunch of things. They, they, they can do kind of like uh, real time uh, delivery of power uh, through the, this technology. So 
again, it's still a little ways away uh, to kind of be commercially ready, uh, but the technology is, you know, has long-term potential. We're at the table on this. Uh, and if the community thinks that there's projects that they'd be well positioned to do, or they want to, you know, be, you know, in the loop on, uh, continue to reach out to you know, your local MLA, uh, our ministries, and we can make sure that we get uh, all the information uh, to the community as well uh, on where we think the potential long-term uh, opportunities may be for the development out of small modular nukes. Um, this is probably more for infrastructure, um, but twinning Highway 9 so that visitors can get to Drumheller even easier. Comment there. And I'll, and I'll ask Nate, Nate, what are your thoughts on this one? Oh, I, I think um, I think that seeing what happened at, at Highway Number Three and the, the process that that took place, I think that it would be very uh, it, it would probably tell a lot to go through the same process. I know I know that uh, Premier's office, uh, Larry Colmeyer, they they went down there and they talked and saw what the economic impact would be of twinning Number Three, and I think it would be probably worthwhile uh, seeing. Uh, doing the math and, and seeing seeing how that would play out as well. Um, most Mostly I hear about uh, fixing our roads instead of twinning them because I, I definitely <laughs> want to see the investment continue in the, in the capital maintenance side. Um, definitely have some roads that need some work, but I think it would be a, a worthwhile effort to, to, to do the math and, and see what twinning would do, especially with the, the 2030 strategy and, uh, and many of us are very hopeful that, you know, Drumheller and the Badlands will pay, play a, a big part in that strategy as we uh, try to create our, our secondary uh, hub uh, away from the Rockies. So, yeah, I, I definitely would, would encourage us to turn over every stone and do the math. I'm building on that concept, uh, Nate, do you have any other ideas around the kind of rail? Uh, or is, is with, we're, we're expanding out irrigation in Southern Alberta. Like how is, are there areas where we need to look at rail or other things uh, for Southern Alberta? Well, I, I know we've, we've spoke uh, at a high level, but yeah, I'd, I'd be very, uh, I, I'd be very uh, enthusiastic to, uh, I've had a few discussions with some of the rail companies, but just to, to relook at uh, rebuilding some of these lines that have been discontinued. Uh, now that we're seeing the, like you, you talked about the, how, how bullish you were about ag and, and this commodity um, uh, economy we're in. Um, you're seeing G3 put up these terminals uh, on all these corridors that have the rail, whereas the, the farmers uh, in and around uh, a lot of this area are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're out pounding out those same roads with Super Beast. So it could, could bring a lot of other uh, value uh, to, to the area and to the rail lines. A uh, comment here um, from Julia with Travel Drum Heller. And so, Doug, I, just so you're aware, Travel Drum Heller is our local um, yeah. destination marketing I'm part of them, tied to uh, uh, somewhat tied to Travel Alberta. Uh, she said it would be great for the government to think about sustainable funding for local destination marketing organizations. Most are funded by voluntary destination marketing fees. Yeah, and this is an, an area where if you have ideas or proposals for what a formula could look like or what we could do here, happy to take a look at it. Uh, I know that we have the, you know, there's the tourism levies that we collect as a province. There's other things that we could take a look at to uh, you know, make sure that this works longer term, as well as with the fact that Travel, Al Travel Alberta is now a destination management organization and we provided them with further funding. Uh, there might be opportunities for further collaboration on that space. So. Happy to take a look at uh, further ideas, proposals. I would uh, you know, keep uh, your local MLA, Nate Horner, in the loop on it. Uh, reach out to our office, uh, as well as my colleague, Martin Long, uh, works with me. He's the parliamentary secretary for uh, tourism and small businesses. So if you haven't had a chance yet to connect with Martin, uh, probably would want to connect you in with him as well for a further chat on the issue. Uh, happy to take a look at it. Thanks. Um, just looking at the time, I know we've got you here till 10 o'clock, so I'm just being um, cognizant of that. I do have a question around trades. I know that the government's um, working on some things to help uh, increase the number of people going into trades. Um, and I think that's great to hear because I know we speak with lots of um, small businesses here that have a really hard time finding apprentices. Um, I don't know if there's any um, plans or thoughts around how to help attract 
uh, trades and apprentices to rural communities, similar to what the what RPAP does to um, attract health professionals? Yeah, and on this one here, I, I won't have all the answers today, but I do know that with the Minister of Advanced Education's focus on apprenticeships uh, and also on you know, applied skills, trades, polytechnics, uh, as well as the Labor Minister's Jobs Now program, we've also done uh, an internship drive with MyTax uh, to create thousands of internships for those first jobs. So we're trying to put in place quite a few programs to help with the cost of bringing people, new people on into the workforce, uh, as well as making sure that we're training people for the right jobs going forward. So happy to, uh, again, take a look at any strategies that you've seen that have been deployed in other areas. Uh, Nate, you may have some further, you may be up more up to speed on this topic than myself. Is there any other thoughts or observations you have for how we could build uh, out that capacity? I, I think it's something maybe we'll have to, get out sure. post pandemic and come back and reconnect and, and, uh, and re retouch on, but uh, uh, definitely, definitely hopeful that the opportunity will be there. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, and send a follow-up note. Uh, gladly follow up uh, with details. If you have ideas, uh, pass them along. I know in the, in the chat, everyone wants to reconnect with you uh, once we get out of this too, Doug, and, and things start going the other way. So Definitely, I would, I'd like to, if I could help facilitate that, um, come do this again. I, I'll always take an excuse to come out to Drumheller. It'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've got some thank yous here in the chat box to you. Thank you for your time. And yes, um, um, some requests that, yes, would you be willing to come back and speak to the group um, within the next six to 12 months? So I'm sure we can find a time for it. I uh, always gladly come out there. Uh, there's a few good burger burger shacks as well in Drummond I'm aware of. So I'd love to come out. Uh, you can always do a burger cook-off or something. That'd be great. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Any other uh, final comments from you or from Nate? I, I just uh, appreciate everybody taking the time. Uh, again, I know we're, it, it, we've probably heard this a few times in this pandemic, but we, there's literally light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it, it, our, if the trajectory and trends uh, hold in Canada that we've seen in the countries that are ahead of us, uh, we're weeks away from having much better news on the health front. Uh, we're looking forward to those days. I, I can't wait to see this pandemic in the rear view mirror, at least in kind of a, getting back to a new normal. Uh, that would be really looking forward to it. I uh, do encourage everybody, we, we are looking towards a very strong rebound in the second half of this year. Uh, one thing I, I didn't mention, but uh, I come from the kind of the, the business corporate world of downtown Calgary, the, the office towers downtown. That was my world before I got into politics. And the law firms, the accounting firms, the banks, they're all going flat out right now. They, they haven't been this busy in years. Uh, and typically between that type of activity, financings, different just kind of drives for deals, typically about six months later, you start to feel it on what, you know, they say Main Street, uh, you start to feel that out in the community. So we really are anticipating a very strong uh, second half of job creation. And then you'll start to see, you know, see that impacts on the oil field service companies, the small businesses across Alberta. So really do take heart that the second half of this year, the rebound, uh, does appear to be very real uh, and you should start feeling it in communities across Alberta here very shortly. Looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Nate, do you have any other final thoughts or? Uh, no, just that um, I, I know how badly everyone wants to be optimistic and I, I too think we're very close and uh, just no one can, no one can wait. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> can't, can't happen soon enough the, the sun's out and I, I just hope we get through the next couple of weeks and uh hopefully we can turn it around for everybody and uh help help with the morale morale out there and and see the economy pick up i think that's what everyone's waiting for so i'm, I'm cheering that on as, as well <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah no well, yes thank, absolutely thank you. sorry do you have any other comments there nate uh, no, no, Heather. Just, uh, just that. I, yeah, Drumheller is a very uh, special, special place. Very interesting composition, and uh, relies heavily on on tourism and traffic. And uh, you know, so maybe been impacted even more heavily than a lot of a lot of communities through this. So I know everyone just desperately wants to to turn this corner and uh, and and get on with it. So looking forward to it. I do think it's it's soon. So. 
thank, thank you all for in, inviting me as, as well. So. Awesome. Yes, I would agree with uh, both your comments. We are very excited to uh, turn the corner and move forward. And, and as you mentioned, Nate, with tourism, um, there's lots of tourism operators that are itching uh, to get going for the season. And, and hopefully we will get uh, a season this year um, and trying to keep that optimism going. So uh, I would like to again, thank Minister Schweitzer for your time this morning. We appreciate you providing us the insight into the recovery plan post pandemic, uh, along with Alberta's plan to grow uh, existing sectors of our economy and expand into new industries. Um, we definitely remain hopeful for uh, better days ahead. And uh, so in closing, uh, we are just a minute before 10 o'clock and again, uh, being cognizant of time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I uh, thank you all for your comments and questions. I think it was a good discussion and we will uh, look forward to another day in the future when hopefully we can reconnect again. So I thank you all for your time today. Thank you all. Thanks. Okay, have a good day. Bye-bye. See you, everybody.